I know that my channel is mostly focused on Nintendo games, so this may come as a bit of a surprise, but I actually really like League of Legends. People say you truly never quit League, and I'm tempted to agree with that. I've been playing League on and off for about the past 10 years, which I can't believe it's been that long, but whenever I find myself with a bit too much free time on my hands, and no matter how many other games I have in my backlog just begging to be played, I always seem to get pulled back to League for at least a few months every one or two years. There's just something about it that's really hard to get away from. All the characters are really cool and the gameplay is complex and strategic. It almost feels like you learn an entire language just by figuring out how to play this game effectively, so to walk away from it is tough. But anytime I go back to the game, it always leads to my soul being completely crushed by the overwhelmingly toxic community. So when I most recently spent the first half of this year grinding solo queue again and getting pretty much nothing else done with my entire life, I decided that once and for all, I've had enough. I am putting League down for good, without exception, and there is no way I am letting myself get dragged back into a destructive relationship with some stupid MOBA. And just like most people do when they get out of a toxic relationship, I hit the rebound. And I hit it hard. Pokemon Unite is a game that most people have probably heard of by now, and if you haven't, it has Pokemon in the name and it's free on your Switch, so I'm going to convince you to try it just by saying that. Seriously though, I have a lot of thoughts on this game as someone who played more than enough League of Legends in my days, I know what makes a MOBA tick, and I have to say, this one's actually surprisingly pretty good. And honestly, this really is a genius idea. They already have hundreds of iconic characters that fans are attached to, and the series is just primed for a game like this that can drip feed new characters or costumes or whatever for years to come. Now, should some of those costumes cost $40? No. Absolutely not, that is way too much for something like a skin in a game, but at the end of the day, I played League for a long time, I spent money on the game for a long time when I did not have to, and I was always responsible about it. I think the bigger picture is that kids just need to learn to be responsible with money in every situation. If spending money here and there makes you enjoy the game more, go for it. Just don't spend your rent payment on it, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, I did also end up getting the battle pass just because I had some gold points on my Nintendo account, but overall, not really worth it. Avatar customization with fashion is, is pretty whatever in my books, so. But holy crap, look at this skin! Look at this animation! This is absolutely batshit crazy! What?! I also think they did a really good job with the initial roster of this game. Like, you've got fan favorites like Charizard and Lucario, or Pikachu and Gengar, of course, but you also have some more obscure picks like Eldegoss and Crustle? Like, I don't know who asked to play as Crustal in this game, but I mean, you can do it. Although any Pokemon spinoff will always skew a little bit towards the Gen 1 is the best gen mentality, there's a pretty good mix of top of the line must haves for a Pokemon game and then the more oddball choices, which is just something you don't see in most games. So I absolutely love it here, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. As far as MOBAs go, Pokemon Unite is about as simple as it gets. Your goal is to score more points than your opponents. How do you score points? Well, you move around the map and you defeat wild Pokemon in order to collect the points and then you also get experience and level up while you do that. Once you have some points collected, you walk up to one of the goals on the opponent's half of the map, you hold down X, and that's how you score. At any point while you're trying to score, an opponent can attack you and stop you from scoring and the goals break after 100 points are scored in them, which makes it harder to score as the match goes on and the goals get closer to the enemy base. Then after 10 minutes, whichever team has the most points wins. It's just that easy. Of course, things get a bit more complicated than that, but those are the basic building blocks that Unite uses for its gameplay. And as you can probably tell, the game really prides itself on not overcomplicating things where it doesn't need to. There's no form of gold to be earned or any sort of in-game shop to buy items and make a character build from. The wild Pokemon all spawn in the same place every match, so there's no kind of minion wave management to worry about. The goals don't even shoot you when you get close to them. You can just stand there as long as you want. Instead of worrying about all these complicated systems trying to layer on top of each other, you just go in, you fight stuff, collect points, and try to score them. 
You stop your opponents from doing the same thing, and just like that, you have yourself a MOBA sandwich. It's simple, easy to understand, and probably most importantly, it doesn't completely alienate someone who's never played a MOBA before. The fact that you're already having fun in Pokemon Unite, the very first game you play, is not something that is easy to do for a game like this. I think the developers definitely understood that designing a MOBA for a console means you're gonna get a wide casual market involved, and the way they chose to not overcomplicate things really helps to secure that audience. And although the game does now have a pretty strong competitive community built around it, it's clear they had the accessibility of the game in mind from the get-go, and this worked wonders when it came to selling the concept of a MOBA off to a casual market. Unite isn't scared to break away from so many of the tropes that come in the genre, and this helps alleviate a lot of the stress that you would find in those high-pressure, ultra-competitive matchmaking games. And another large contributor to that laid-back atmosphere that you can't find anywhere else is because there's no way to type to your teammates. Because you aren't literally sitting directly in front of a keyboard, you know, using it to play the game, you can't directly and instantly give your teammates grief for their mistakes. Now this may not sound like a big deal to some, probably people who've never played a MOBA? But this makes a really big difference in how long you're able to keep your sanity while playing through ranked matches in this game. The communication system in this game all boils down to a couple predetermined messages that you can ping to your teammates. These phrases allow you to give your team a heads up about certain events, like grouping up to score some points or defend one of your goals, which, of course, is very linear and limited, but also more than sufficient in most cases. Like I've said, Unite at its core is pretty simple, so you don't really need a whole plethora of messages to send to your teammates. You just need a couple key phrases that say, hey, go here and help me. Of course, there's always gonna be teammates who choose to ignore your messages and do their own thing, but if that's the price I have to pay for not having someone call me a piece of shit, idiot who should and drink their blood and with his dad and then while you lick it off your using the Dewey Decimal System? Well, I think that's worth it. So let's dive a little deeper into the game's mechanics. Your Pokemon has two abilities to start the game with, and as you level up, each of your two abilities has two more different abilities that you can choose from, giving you some flexibility in how you wanna play each Pokemon. Or at least that's the idea, but sadly a lot of these second level abilities aren't super well balanced, and some are just clearly better than the other ones. It's a shame to see, but instead of picking abilities based on the state of the particular match or who you're playing against, you'll quickly find out which abilities are just the best ones overall and be using them 99% of the time when you play that Pokemon, regardless of how the game is going. A bit of a nitpick, but there's no in-game shop to buy items or equipment while you're in a match, so these abilities are pretty much the only customization you get once you're locked into a game, so it would be nice if, you know, all of the options were a bit more viable across the entire cast instead of just being this is the way to play this Pokemon and if you choose this ability, you're trolling and deserve to be banned. Then there's your Unite move, which are basically just insane abilities for every Pokemon across the board. This third ability is unlocked at a much later level, so you're about halfway through the game before you even get it. And being the namesake of the game, it should tell you that these moves are pretty crazy. Unite moves usually have a long downtime between uses, and they come with a crazy amount of damage or some other fight winning effect, so you definitely want to be finding the right time to use your Unite move if you want to swing the game in your favor. Other than your Pokemon's abilities, you also get a battle item. These you can equip before the game starts, and it gives yourself a bit of an edge every minute or so. Hit the button to do anything from boost your attack or speed, to speeding up how quickly you can score a goal. These are also a nice addition to give you a bit more customization, but once again, not the most balanced mechanic. Don't be surprised when you see every single person using the eject button as soon as they have it unlocked, because being able to teleport a short distance is so versatile that it's almost impossible to pass this up. You can use it to chase someone or to escape from someone. You can even go through walls with it. And just to let you know, the League of Legends equivalent is just as, if not more popular and is used 99% of the time on every single character in the game. You know what, don't even call this eject button. Just call it flash, because that's what it is. Where the actual, real customization comes in is finally in the form of the held items. Held items are your one true way of customizing your Pokemon to actually suit your playstyle. Each held item gives base stats as well as a unique passive trait that really helps you feel the difference in how you're playing. 
Some of the items can't be described as uh, bigger number equals good, but others have much more specific abilities that give you a huge boost, but only in certain situations. Some items are better suited for some Pokemon too, because special attack and attack are actually separate stats in this game, so you should make sure you know what type of damage you're dealing before trying to put some of your items into your loadout. Because hey, at the end of the day, even if you have 15% more special attack, if you don't use special attack, that's not gonna help you too much. So as you can see, the held item system is great for a lot of reasons. They give you control over how your character feels to play with actual tangible gameplay differences and matches depending on what you have equipped it. But at the same time, I hate to say it, but the system at its core is completely flawed. You see, unlike the battle items, which are simply unlocked as you level up and they only have one way they can be used, the held items need to be bought from the shop, which is fine, but they also each have their own individual levels. Every held item goes from level 1 to level 30, with literal stat increases for each new level and an increase to the item's passive ability at level 10 and level 20. That means that a level 10 buddy barrier is just strictly better than a level 1 buddy barrier. You can probably see where I'm going with this, but it gets much worse. So you might be thinking, how do you level the items up? You must just play games with them equipped to your character or something, right? Well, no. You have to use what is known as an item enhancer. Okay, great. You get item enhancers through quests and you can buy them from the shop and they cost tickets, which are only earned through the in-game progression system. I don't want to get too deep into all the currencies this game has going on, because there's actually like 10 different ones for some reason, but the three basic ones are the coins, which you get just from playing the game. They're basically experience points you can use in the shop. The tickets are the in-game item you get for quests or events or things like that, out of the battle pass, whatever. You just get them from playing the game and doing specific things. And the gems are the currency that you buy with actual real world money. So this should be all good. The item enhancers are bought with tickets, which you earn through in-game progression. You can't buy them with real money. So that means that a player cannot get a numerical stat advantage just by spending real money. Well, that's where you're wrong. You see, the item enhancers cost tickets until you click on it when you have no tickets and then you're allowed to buy tickets by using gems which you buy with real money what what yes that's right you can spend actual real world money on this game to give your character better stats before the game even begins you can play against someone using the exact same character as you and already have this much of an advantage at level one like, I just don't understand. The system was already in place. You can clearly see these are meant to be bought with tickets. Tickets are earned slowly as you progress through the game and do more quests and whatever. So if you could only get them with tickets, the people being matched together would have roughly the same level held items as everyone else because they've played the game roughly the same amount. So why in the world would you allow players to exchange gems for tickets? It just really makes no sense why they did this, other than to fill their own pockets, which, of course, is a motive here, but it's just so disappointing to see. What is even the point of dividing the currencies that you earn in the game if you can just trade between them anyway? And I know I said I don't want to talk about all these currencies, but this is really where this game starts to feel like a mobile game. I just can't be bothered to even learn the difference between a holo ticket and a fashion ticket because I just, I just don't even care at this point. I will say though, and this is not defending the game, but thankfully Pokemon Unite matches tend to have a lot of bigger things at play that will affect what team wins or loses beyond, you know, my attacks do 30 more damage than yours so I'll kill you over and over. It's hard to explain, but an item like this in Pokemon Unite is not nearly as impactful as it would be in a game like League of Legends. Like, don't get me wrong, the players with level 30 items or whatever will unquestionably be at an advantage if they play against people with level 1 items, but it's not to the point where you could just spend $200 and automatically win every single game that you play. And trust me, as someone who has climbed the ranks from the bottom all the way to the top, the pay to win aspect of Unite has definitely been a little bit overstated online. Leveling up your items in the beginning will definitely help you win more fights and get a better hang for the game, 
but don't think you're gonna get all the way to Masters just because you have a couple level 30 items. I absolutely think you can win more games through the decisions you make as opposed to the weight of the wallet you're bringing into the fight, and that is for a lot of reasons, but mostly it's due to the fact that the game is so swingy in the second half when all the objectives start to stack up. And that's the last thing I really have to talk about that goes on in the actual matches. Objective Pokemon spawn throughout the match, starting with Rotom and Dreadnought in the top and bottom lane, and then later on, Zapdos in the center. These three Pokemon will be the main way that you lock in your victories. Like, trust me, scoring 25 points at the beginning of the game may seem like it's helpful, but by the time you get to the end, you'll realize how small of a difference it actually makes. Rotom and Dreadnought both appear at the 7 minute mark, and they respawn every 2 minutes after they're defeated. I would say Rotom is the least significant of the 3 objective Pokemon, so we'll start there. When Rotom's defeated, it gives you 20 points and it starts moving towards the closest enemy goal in the top lane. If it's able to touch the goal, it allows your team to instantly score points in it for a short time. That is a big if though, considering that it stops to attack any enemies standing in its path, and that gives them plenty of time to fight back. All they have to do is kill it before it gets to their goal, and you don't really get much of an advantage off of it. Sure, Rotom can be a good way to score some extra points if a good opportunity presents itself and your team is a bit more organized than theirs is, but with how relatively easy it is to stop Rotom from pushing down the lane, I would say it's pretty rare that a stray Rotom will net a very significant advantage for your team. Like I say, take it if you can, but I wouldn't give up better opportunities just to get that extra couple points. Better opportunities, meaning Dreadnought. When Rotom spawns in the top lane, Dreadnought spawns in the bottom lane. Dreadnought gives your entire team a bundle of experience and a shield for a short time, as well as the same 20 points that Rotom does. It's important to note that it doesn't matter where the rest of your team is. When Dreadnought dies, no matter where they are on the map, they also get the experience and shield. They do not have to be one of the people who helped kill it. So that is really good. Dreadnought's a bit harder to kill than Rotom is, and I think that should be enough of an explanation that the buff he gives off is much nicer to have. The shields for your team are large enough that you should be able to win almost any fight immediately after securing the kill on Dreadnought, and the experience you get can really actually make the difference when it's enough to give you a level advantage over the other team. Not to mention, the earlier your team is able to get ahead in levels, the more likely you are to continue to beat them in more and more fights, meaning you'll start to snowball and your team will be super far ahead in no time. Like I said, Rotom and Dreadnought may spawn at the same time, but your focus should always be making sure you get the Dreadnought first. It's simply too good to pass up. You can get the Rotom later if you need to, but Dreadnought is just way too good at turning the tides in your favor. And not to mention that two minutes later, you'll be able to fight and probably win the second Dreadnought, which puts your team even further ahead. And trust me when I say, having two Dreadnoughts under your belt will make things look pretty bleak for your opponents pretty quick. Well, I mean at least until Zapdos spawns. I know I just said that Dreadnought is what really helps you turn the tides, but Zapdos? Well, Zapdos can win you the game on its own sometimes. Forget about everything that has happened in the match so far, I'm being serious when I say you can win the game just from the Zapdos kill alone. And that's because you could potentially earn 500 points for your team here. Yes, 500. 500, zero, zero. you heard me correctly. Suddenly that 25 points you scored with the Rotom doesn't seem so good, does it? Zapdos spawns at the 2 minute mark, and it deals a lot of damage and has a lot of health. It's really hard to kill compared to the other objectives, so make sure your whole team is involved if you're going to go for this. Getting the final hit on the Zapdos gives you 30 points, and it gives every other member of your team 20 points. But that's not all. Remember the Rotom buff that lets you score instantly on the goal when it reaches it? Well, Zapdos gives that buff to every single goal on the opponent's side of the map. So, with the newfound 110 points that was just given to your team, plus anything else you were holding up to a maximum of 50, you can now go score in any goal instantaneously for the next 20 seconds or so. Oh, and did I mention in the last two minutes of the game any scored points are doubled? Yeah, so your entire team gets an opportunity to score up to 100 points instantaneously on any goal on the map. Can you see why you probably want to kill the Zapdos? This is mostly what I was talking about when I was saying the held items help, but they don't automatically decide the game for you. 
because a lot of games are coin flipped by who gets the Zapdos kill. Now I say coin flipped, but the higher rank you get, the more you start to realize that playing around how the Zapdos gets fought is probably the most important part of the entire game. So it's not really a coin flip in the sense that either team could get it as long as you play correctly. But at the end of the day, that's just what it's all about. You need to understand what you need to be doing in order for the Zapdos to go to your team. And fighting it is not always the answer to that question. No matter how far ahead you are, if you know you're ahead, you shouldn't be trying to fight the Zapdos. Because all that does is give the enemy team an opportunity to come steal the kill and win the game. If you're ahead, what you need to be doing is stopping the other team from taking the Zapdos whether that's through zoning or distracting them by going for sneaky behind the back goals, whatever. Killing the Zapdos yourself is not always the winning play. And in fact, a lot of the time it can end up being the losing play. If you are behind though, the second you get a team advantage by killing one or two of the enemy Pokemon, you wanna be rushing that thing as fast as you can. And otherwise, just, just leave it alone. If you don't need it, you don't need it. You're already winning. Stop! The fact that Zapdos swings the game so hard sometimes is pretty hotly debated in the community, but honestly, I played all the way up to Masters. I had no problem learning how to play around the Zapdos. And honestly, a lot of people think of it as a coin flip, but if you just learn to play correctly and how to zone people out of it or get the final hits or whatever, it's actually not that bad. Like you can single-handedly steal games away just by getting good at last hitting Zapdos. In a way, that's a good thing, not a bad thing, because if you as a player get good and are better than everyone else in your lobby, like you so often say that you are, you should be winning pretty much all of your games based on this alone. Not to sound too harsh, but you know, sometimes you gotta you gotta look at yourself, look at your own gameplay, see what you're doing. How can you how can you do better? You know? It's not always the teammates. It's just one of those things that's like, at the end of the day, if you wanna climb and you wanna rank up, being the best player in the lobby is the best way to do that. And if you're not, well, then you should be working on improving instead of blaming the other people. And trust me, if you're losing your game, the chances you are the best player in the lobby is almost zero. So I guess that's my rank up advice. I don't claim to be, you know, a super expert on it or anything, but, I feel like when you play League, you go one of two ways. You either enter the mindset of self-improvement and reflection, or you enter the mindset of toxicity and my team is bad and everyone else sucks and I'm stuck in silver because of them. And that's just not helpful to anyone. So just think about yourself, how you play, how you can get better. And I promise if you do that and you actively try to improve, you will start winning more games. Like the amount of times I see people just push onto someone's goal and try to fight them one on two while they're shielded and regenerating. And it's like, like, what are you fighting for right now? Or the amount of people who just stand in the middle of the match and just, just, they just stand there and do nothing. Like there's all these Pokemon that you could go kill and level up, but you're just, you're just standing there. Nothing is stronger than improving your decision making. That's all I'm trying to say. But at the end of the day, you can load up this game, get into a match, have fun for 10 full minutes. It's not too long, it's not too short. You feel like you made an impact, then you're out of there. And if you're onto the next one, you're onto the next one. If not, you put your switch down and you go do something else. It really is a super, super tight gameplay loop that just keeps you wanting more every single time you play. You don't have to think way too much about what items do I buy or what build should I go with or whatever. You just load up, you slap some shit around and you have a good time. And at the end of the day, that makes this one of the most perfect free to play Switch games I have tried. I think this game caught a lot of people by surprise and myself included. I mean, I didn't expect it to be more than a small distraction for a couple of hours that I would try and then delete immediately, but I ended up spending over 70 hours in this game to get to the highest rank of ranked mode. That's something I definitely did not expect to do, and I wouldn't have done it if there wasn't a lot of fun to be had in this game. If you haven't tried out Pokemon Unite yet, I would definitely recommend that you do. Like I said, it's free, you have nothing to lose, and even if you're not a League of Legends type person, this is a 
great entry point. Like, it's never been easier to play an accessible MOBA that just makes sense as soon as you pick it up. So I can't recommend this game enough. Whether you play it by yourself or get a group of friends together and all try it at once, you're gonna have a good time either way. Maybe you won't play it quite as much as I did because I have a goopy goblin gamer brain and, and this competitive drive that just cannot be satiated. Yeah, there's something wrong with me. But anyway, I think you'll have fun regardless. And that's gonna do it for this video. When will you see me next? Who knows? Subscribe and you'll see me come back eventually with another video. Bye bye for now.